Good morning, everyone. We already said many times, but happy Easter again. It's a very beautiful day, sunny, and a very special holiday. And I'm very happy to be able to talk about Easter. Easter is not important just to, to Spiritism, but to many different religions. And to be able to talk about it, we need to do a reflection. We are going to do a trip. We are going to travel back in time. Like we had, uh, if we could have a special machine to go back in time. And I will try to talk about all those items. Let me see how it is. the red one? No, 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 no. So I will try to talk about all these topics a little bit about each. And you have to use your imagination and transport yourself to the time to be able to fully understand. So we are gonna, first thing we're gonna talk is about Passover. We cannot talk about Easter without talking about Passover. We have to understand what Passover was to be able to understand what is Easter. And now let's think about the time of Moses. The Israelites, because they had not become Hebrews or Jewish yet, they were Israelites. And then the Israelites had been slaves of the Egyptians for 400 years. For 400 years, they were people that they were slaves. And then, if you saw all the beautiful movies, God came to Moses and told Moses, go back to Egypt, leave the desert go back to Egypt, talk to the Pharaoh, and free my people. And then that's what he did. So he did. He went there, he spoke to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh actually was a child that they both grew together. If you saw the movies, you understand that the Moses was actually taken from the river Nile and adopted by the sister of the big Pharaoh in that time. And the little Pharaoh grew up with Moses. So they had a very close relationship. The story is very long, I'm not going to talk about that. But then Moses come to his brother, the Pharaoh of that time, and tell him, I came here because God had told me that now you need to leave the people, the Israelites people free. You need to free them. And of course the Pharaoh said, <laughs> are you kidding me? No, I'm not going to do that. Of course, he didn't say with these words, but that's more or less what he said. And then God told Moses, so prepare the Pharaoh because I will send many plagues to force him to do it. So he sends 10 plagues. It was not supposed to be 10, one, one. I will send one that will disturb them and will make the Pharaoh change his mind. But every time the plague happened, the Pharaoh got distraught, and then he said to Moses, okay, talk to your God that I will let you go, your people go. Mo Moses did that, and then nothing happened. The Pharaoh said, no, 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 I changed my mind, I'm not gonna do that. And then came another plague, another plague, another plague, and then came the final plague, the most uh, distraught of them all. And then he told Moses, go and speak to the Pharaoh, because now will be a devastating one. Will be a plague that every firstborn child will die. And then Moses was like, but that's going to be terrible. Everyone? Yes, everyone. And then Moses went to talk to the Pharaoh, and then the Pharaoh, of course, didn't believe. For me, it's hard to, like, how he didn't believe, like, so many other plagues already happened, exactly like uh, Moses had, and he still didn't believe. This is a very hard head Pharaoh. And then nothing changed. And then Moses returned very upset because he knew what was going to happen. And at the same time, God gave his specific details to Moses to guide the Israelites, to guide the firstborn of the Israelites. So let's go. So here, 
this this is very beautiful. This is the final place. So God advised Moses that the Jewish families had to bring a lamb, a little lamb, one year old, a baby, a baby animal, a baby lamb, into their homes. And on the Sabbath day, to sacrifice and eat it. Then to spread the animal's blood outside their door and outside their windows to protect them against the angel of death. So there is a video that's super ultra popular circulating everywhere of Harold Dutra explaining this in beautiful details. You close your eyes, you listen to his voice, and you imagine. So he describes that the family, seven days with this adorable animal, everybody loved the animal. I can just imagine. You know, the kids so connected to it. And on the Sabbath day, they had to kill the animal. So they had to be even present. They had to be together in the moment the baby was going to die. Why? This is like so crazy. It's so much pain. It's so difficult. And besides that, you had to eat the meat of the animal. Every single thing. Everything. And then God even gives the specifics. If your family is too small, get together with another one so you can eat the whole, fa the whole meat together. And that's what they did. So he also, Aroldo Dutra, explains that this pain was necessary. This pain was necessary. You had to feel this pain in order to experience freedom. Freedom of many things, freedom of your mind, of your old habits, of the things you had been living. So you had to go through pain to change. And in our lives, this happens too. Sometimes when everything is good, you don't change. But when that moment comes, you experience a horrible pain, a, a problem, and you are able to overcome it, then you change. Then you realize, wow, I needed that pain to be able to see things in a different way. And that's more or less what, uh, what happened at that time. And then we have the word, Passover. So Passover is the angel of death passed over the Jewish homes when killing the Egyptians firstborn. Then finally, the Pharaoh allowed the Israelites to be free. If you saw the movies, you know, he changed his mind again and everything goes on. And then we have the Jewish people celebrating Passover. So they celebrate the freedom from Egyptian slavery in 1240 before Christ. So this is what, uh, what is really Passover. So that's what uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters, they celebrate. So this is the moment, the famous moment that Moses opened the river so the Israelites can cross to freedom. So now that uh, you understand this, you understand that the Passover was the angel of death passing over, protecting the houses that had experienced that uh, pain before freedom, now we can start our lecture. And who is Jesus? Not who was Jesus. Jesus is alive. He's alive in spirit. We are all spiritists and we understand the physical body dies, but the spirit lives forever. So, you know, in every single spirit is that everybody says, oh, Jesus is the most enlightened spirit ever. He's the governor of earth. He's this, he's that. And I know a lot of guys, you hear that and you're like, yeah, well, Susanna said that must be true. But where did Susanna get these messages? Where we all get these messages? That's why it's so important for us to study. Because when we study, we don't say, oh, in a lecture of uh, Susanna, she said that. Now we know where this information was brought. Was brought by? enlightened spirit. So let's research in our books. The first book that you can find is the Spirit's book. Question 625. Kardec asked, what is the most perfect type of, uh, the most perfect type that God has offered to human beings as their guide and model? Look at Jesus. That's it. So he is the most 
perfect time. He is what we have to use as inspiration and guidance. So when we say Jesus is the most perfect time, we're not using our imagination. The spirits brought to us in this book in 1857 already said that. And then you continue your research, your studies, and you go to this super important book, Genesis, that not many people study, because Genesis is a little bit difficult. A lot of people say, oh, Genesis is difficult. Yes, but it's one of the most beautiful books, and has explanations that you can never imagine. Has explanations to every single point that people use their imaginations to think. Like, for example, when Jesus walked the sea, he walked the ocean and went to the boat to meet the disciples who were in distraught. How Jesus walked on the ocean, I'm not going to tell you, you have to go there, you have to read, and you will understand. So, in this book, uh, Kardec gets all the explanations of the miracles. They were not miracles. They were, they were absolutely possible, scientific, explained, and even for us, because we understand, we understand the phenomena of energy, we understand the fluids, and Jesus being the most perfect spirit, he knew how to manipulate this very, very well. And that Jesus, as you can imagine, he lived 99% of a spiritual life and 1% of physical life. The 1% was his body here. But when he looked at us, he saw everything. He saw what we were, what was our past, what we were thinking, all the spirits connected to us. And even when he did the miracles, like when he removed the evil spirits, he already saw and he spoke to them. He saw what was surrounding that the person. So he was able to have this fully vision that we can't, but he could. So all this is explained there. And Jesus also was the medium of God because he was perfect. He is not here to get a medium, to get a spirit to help us. He is the one helping us. So he is the medium of God. And then this fantastic book, On the Way to the Light, Emmanuel tells us that Jesus is part of a community of pure spirits that coordinate the evolution of the solar system. So Jesus is the divine builder. Here also in this book, we understand there are many spirits called Christs. So our Christ is Jesus. Jesus Christ. He is the one who takes care of this planet. But there are many other Christs that take care of other planets. And it's a beautiful book with so many deta details and you have to go there to understand everything. So, you know, write it down, buy the books, and read it. You need it. And this is a wonderful book too. Evolution in two words. I'm not sure if it's already in English. It was supposed to be last year, but I'm not sure if it's done. But here you can see the spiritual body evolves in the spiritual life through education of human habits through the centuries, preparing to the arrival of Christ, the spiritual governor of Earth. So it's here in this book that we understand that Jesus is the governor of earth. He is the one responsible for really putting your, our planet together and coordinating the millions of spirits who are going to be inhabiting here. And then we go, we move on to my favorite book, my favorite ever, 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 2,000 years ago. So before I talk about what I want to say here, I have to say, like, when I moved to the United States, I got this book to read. I am fascinated by very thick books. So I got this book and I start reading. And uh, me and my husband, no kids, we were on vacation in North Carolina in a small hotel, in a pool. So I am reading the book. I'm reading the book. 
And then I am traveling with the book. So I remember I arrived in a horrible scene, a lot of tough things in this book. And I am crying really bad. But I'm crying, I'm devastated. <laughs> and I'm so into the book that I don't realize the pool is a small pool and have a lot of people. And, like, <laughs> and then I even like change the page and I'm like, and I breathe, and then I go back, and I turn, and I cry again, and then I, and I do like this. When I look, everybody's like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, oh. <laughs> and then I was like, should I share the book with all of them? What should I do? <laughs> I just took my sunglasses, I put them, and I started. Ah. That's the feeling of the book. It's so strong, it's so powerful that you can really travel with the book, understanding. And imagine, if you were there, what would you be doing? And don't think you're going to be, I would never do that. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> you probably would be the one inciting the one, oh yeah, do it too. Yes, because we evolve. But you know, if you're still here in this condition, over 2,000 years, is because we were not doing very well in that time. Mm. So here, in this book, there is a letter a letter from the senator Paul de Lent, who was describing Jesus to the Homer Emperor, Tiberius Caesar. And I know that nowadays there is a lot of things in the internet describing Jesus kind of ugly, and it's hard for us to connect with him like that because the image we always saw Jesus, this fantastic, beautiful, handsome man, super white, for living in that time in the desert, I know it's difficult, but the description that the model brings to us is very close to this. And also the description of the beautiful painter Akiyami, she really makes a beautiful, handsome Jesus, much more tan than we imagine. But the way that I can visualize compared to what Emmanuel said. The description I'm bringing now is of a description of a letter, a real letter, that was found from the period of Jesus and is not exactly the same of what Emmanuel describes, but is extremely similar. Is really, really similar. And then it's huge, but the little pieces. He's a tall man, well shaped, hair and beard of nut brown color, his eyes blue, clear and serene, look innocent, dignified, manly and mature. He rebukes with majesty, counsels with mild mildness, eloquent and grave. No man has seen him laugh. Yet his manners are exceedingly pleasant. He is temperate, modest, and wise. A man for his extraordinary beauty. So, I stay with Emmanuel because as I know to say, Emmanuel not made a mistake yet. So, I stay with him. And this is the image that brings to me. But we don't need to worry about the image. Jesus is beautiful by the inside. This is just for our physical minds to think. And now we already know all this. We know that Jesus is the spiritual governor of earth. And we know also he took more or less 1,000 years to be able to condense his Paris spirit. Imagine, he is just light and love. And he needs to condense himself to come back here to live with us. Heavy beings. Imagine, we are difficult now imagining that time. So he took a long time to be able to do it. And also he had to wait for the planet to evolve, to arrive in the perfect moment that he could deliver the message. He knew his mission was difficult. He was going to be born a very, very simple Jewish man. No, no powers. Was the planet changed? Yes, it changed. We even have a calendar before him and after him. But did we change? That's the thing. Did we change? Not at all. So now, we have to understand that Jesus was Jewish. He was an Israelite and he followed the traditions. So in the time of Passover, people from all cities, they were traveling to Jerusalem to the big feast. And Jesus did the same thing with his disciples. And every single minute of his life was a lesson. 
there is no little thing that he didn't take that opportunity, opportunity to teach. And he was preparing his disciples for the tough times that, uh, that were coming. And the disciples, as little kids, they started, what? You're leaving? What? What? Who's going to be the, the president of the spiritual center of Jesus? Who's going to be? And then they start fighting. And they start like getting like kids. And Jesus, as always, take the opportunity to teach. And this is the beautiful moment of uh, washing the feet, where Jesus comes and he goes to every single of his disciples and he wash their feet. In that time, they lived in the desert. They walked a lot in the desert with sandals. So every single home had a single person, a humble servant, who one of their jobs was to wash their feet, to clean the dirty of the, the, their feet. So when Jesus decided him to do that, they were all shocked because this was not for him to do it. They were supposed to do it to Jesus. And then they just teaches. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to watch to wash one another's feet. So what is his he is teaching him? He is teaching humbleness. He is really letting them know that humility is very important. You who wants to be the first, you have to be the last. You have to think that the we need to do this within us. And it's not easy. We, we don't understand that. We understand that the ones here are the most famous ones, the, the ones who know everything. And uh, I always say no. The ones here, they talk a lot. They love to talk. So they are here. And uh, it's up to each one of us to be able to take the message and fulfill the message. That's the, the main problem that we don't do. We listen, oh, it's beautiful. Do we do it? No. And then comes the, the tough night. So many things would happen here. So other symbolisms. So the bread is his body. The wine is his blood. And then, a <coughs> few days ago I was watching a lecture of Anete Guimarães, a very good speaker from Brazil. And she even explained that the, the bread in the Hebrew language means knowledge. So the bread is knowledge. All the symbolism of bread in the Jewish culture is knowledge. And the wine or water means faith. So they need these two items to be able to evolve. And in Spiritism we understand that a really evolved being is morally evolved and intellectually evolve. So we always need to have these two in very good balance to be able to be an enlightened spirit. So Jesus is food. He is our food, our spiritual food. With this food, we are never going to be hungry. Never, never. And he gives these three messages. I will have to leave you. One of you will betray me. And then, Peter, you will deny me three times. And I just imagine Peter, no, never, I will die for you. And I also think I would say the same. <laughs> Not me, I love you, I will do everything for you. And then Jesus, no, Peter, honey, sorry, you will deny me three times. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe. Like, he was absolutely in love with Jesus. But when the moment comes, this is for all of us. We say, no, I will never do it. And then when the, the moment comes, oh, yeah, you did. So never say never. <laughs> you never know. And then comes to the tough time, the de very devastating time of the crucifixion, of the abandonment. Jesus had 12 disciples that followed him like little lambs everywhere with him. But when the tough time came, what happened? So Jesus explained to him, explained to them. And he said he was destined to suffer grievously, be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and then 
three days later to rise. So they were at this moment here, very similar to the moment of Passover. They were experiencing that pain. Their little lamb, that the, the symbol is Jesus, was this loving being that stayed with them, just showing love, so many teachings, curing people, even resurrection people from death. He's gone, and they were feeling really distraught. But they were not able to stay with Jesus. They were human beings full of problems like we are all. So the ones who really stayed were those three. Those three, who are those three? The mother. The mother goes with the kids anywhere, anywhere. Even to jail, we go, we are there. And that's the mother of Jesus, she would do the same. Mary Magdalene, the one that was absolutely transformed from prostitution to being one of the most bright disciples in the time that women were absolutely nothing. And John the Evangelist, the one that Jesus always said, he is my, my child, the one that he really loved, the youngest one, and the only disciple who was not killed. He died of an old age. So only these three were able to stay with him. Then we come to the apparitions. So the most famous one is this, but there are many. In the book of Genesis, you can read about all of them. So this is Mary of Magdalene when she goes to his tomb. So in the Gospel of John we have Mary Magdalene found Jesus' tomb empty. Inside of it she saw two angels. Then turning she saw a man who asked her why she was crying. She explained not recognizing Jesus himself. Only when he said her name she answered, Haboni. That means Lord. So in that moment, she recognized it's Jesus. Then we all know that she ran towards him, and then he told her, don't touch me. I haven't gone to the Father yet. Go to the others and tell them what you saw. And that's exactly what she did. But there are all these other ones that you can see in Genesis again, a beautiful book that please read it read it and study. So there are six. So the main things that we can take is that Mary saw Jesus. Then these two men, they walked and ate with him. In the Genesis, they explain Jesus ate with him. So for us, again, it's very difficult. How a spirit can eat? Well, we can't. If I die and appear here, I don't think I will be able to, but Jesus is different. And if you go there with the detailed explanations, you can understand. And then he appeared to the disciples and ate fish. He appeared. So the house was closed. They were all hiding. They were all afraid. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. And suddenly, Jesus appears inside of the house. And then, you know, let's finish. Then a Thomas. Thomas comes and has to touch the wounds because just looking, he didn't believe he had to touch it. So the descriptions are physical descriptions. So the apparitions are materializations that we explain in Spiritism. Materializations that are po possible and they are actually cataloged. A few years ago, in a museum in Manhattan, the Metropolitan Museum, there was a special event with materializations from around the world. And there were many materializations from Brazil there, pictures taken. So don't think it's impossible, it is possible. And then we have the, the two final ones when he appeared and he gave a huge fish feast to the disciples and the final one, when he went to the city of Bethany and he said goodbye to the disciples and he raised to heaven. So there is a description that he goes up in another symbolism for us to imagine it's raising to heaven, to a good life, to a, the real life, the life of the spirit, freed from the body 
And we don't need to imagine that Jesus had any kind of things to, to really um, how can I, clean himself because he was pure. He actually came here to help us to understand it. So Easter means liberation. But it's not a liberation for Jesus. He was free from anything. It's a liberation for us. For us to understand. And you can also imagine as a liberation from him in the sense of getting rid of his physical body who couldn't allow him to be 100% free. But as you saw before, he was 99% free. So here, this is what the Christian Catholic, Catholics say. <coughs> they celebrate Jesus' resurrection three days after his crucifixion. It confirmed Jesus as the powerful Son of God. So again, we go back to the moment of crucifixion. Why we needed the crucifixion? So much pain. Why we needed that? Again, we had to experience pain to be able to free our mentality and to change, to wake up, to have an awaken. And the materializations helped us and helped the disciples. I just imagine me as a disciple saying, oh, so what he said was true. Oh, amazing. And it was important because they were human beings like us. They needed more proof. And Jesus asked them, reunite yourselves to celebrate love, my dedication for you, and the reality of immortality of the soul. What we always talk here in the Spiritism, every day, every day, and it's so difficult for so many other people to understand. But they do believe in Jesus, but they just believe this resurrection only could happen to Jesus. All of us, it doesn't happen. But we have to understand that we are all different human beings and we have to respect other people that think different than us. This is also one of the lessons of Easter. We're going to see it later. So this is a little thing, just a curiosity for you guys. We can even give a lecture on this. So the Second Constantinople Council, 553, after Christ, reincarnation was removed from the Bible by the Emperor Justinian, influenced by his wife Theodora, who was afraid of the karma's law. This is a beautiful story, and it's actually historical and cataloged. So it's not a spiritist uh, influence or, or book here, but it, this is historical. And, uh, we even have many videos of historians doing research on that, so we can talk about it later. I don't have much time to go into this one here. Then we have the important difference between resurrection and reincarnation. Well, it's not really a difference, but it's, it's important for us to understand both. So rich resurrection, a dead body transforms into a body that physically rises to immortality. It restores life to a dead being, to a dead being. This is against the law of nature. And even Jesus is not what happened to him. It's not his physical body who woke up and, and started living with the, the disciples. It's not his physical body. It was his spiritual body, his spirit who condensed itself and was living with them. And then we have reincarnation. Reincarnation is the rebirth into a new body, a new life. This is the same spirit, but in a different body. That's what we all understand in spiritism. And Jesus himself told the apostles, John was the reincarnation of the prophet Elijah. Of course, he didn't mention reincarnation, but he said, John had come already, and you did not recognize him. So, John, no, I'm sorry, Elijah had come yet and you didn't recognize him because he returned as uh, John the Baptist. Then, why the need of the crucifixion? I talked a little bit about that. So, in this moment, this tough moment, 
when these three sentences were echoing in their minds. I will have to leave you, one of you will betray me, and uh, Peter, you will deny me three times. So you can just imagine the sadness they felt in that moment. One will betray you, how is that possible? We love you, who will, be, who will have the guts to do it? And uh, Peter, the one who loved him so much, who he said would edify my house, betrayed three times? It's very hard for us to, to really connect with this. But uh, it happened. And then it was important to make the disciples to be able to fully experience some of this and many other feelings. Shock, pain, suffering, despair, loneliness, loneliness. That person you love so much, imagine just your mother. <coughs> just go back to a little simple thing. Someone you love like your mother, for example, or another human being, your grandmother, who knows. And then that person dies. And even if that person dies in a normal way of old age, you will experience so much pain. Imagine Jesus, who so many movies re describe in a terrible way he died. So you experience all of this. And they couldn't do anything to change. There was nothing they could do to change. So they were just in that down mood. But it was important to them, as we go back to Passover, the pain was important. And then, why the materializations, you know, the apparitions we said before? Why? Well, I think you already know, but it helped the disciples to solidify their faith, to get strength to spread the gospel. They really needed to be 100% sure of that, because what they were going to be experiencing was not going to be an easy task. So they really needed to be strong to be able to fulfill their mission. The proof of immortality of the souls, the communicability with the spirits. So now they fully understand. They really can talk to the spirits and they can be listen. And Jesus told them, I will be living. My physical body will be living. But I will be always here with you, helping and guiding you. And then the connection between the spiritual and the material plans of life. We are always connected. And uh, we know we are always connected, but sometimes we forget. <coughs> when we are really distraught, when we are going through all kinds of problems, instead of uh, praying and connecting and asking for help of Jesus, God, the enlightened spirits, guardian angel, we don't remember. We go into the mood of poor me, oh, poor me. And then we disconnect totally. And then I, I, I just imagine the guardian angel say, oh, Angela, calm down, calm down. This also shall pass. And we forget. But it's so important for us that when we are suffering, when we are going through pain, calm down. One second, connect with the enlightened beings, and you will see light you will experience. Like here is a symbolism of the disciples that after they saw Jesus, after they got the strength, saying, yes, everything he said is true. Now we have the power. Now we can go out and we can do everything he said and taught us to do. And I put this part here because it's important for us, especially in America, because, you know, America have this, this cute tradition. You know, the bunnies and the eggs, and the kids love to go to the parks to get the chocolate. It's cute, but we cannot allow the kids just to think like that. And, you know, the kids get a little bit older, they don't even understand, like, so bunnies, they put eggs? I thought just chicken. <laughs> You have to teach them. It is a symbolism. But where this idea came from? You know, we can teach Jesus, the history of Jesus, and also we can continue with the cute chocolate eggs tradition. So this tradition is called Osterhaus. 
don't know if it's like this is pronounced because it's a German word, but it is a pagan tradition from Protestant German immigrants that arrived in 1700s in Pennsylvania. So also, the bunnies and eggs, they are a symbol of fertility, new life, rebirth. So it's beautiful. And in the south of Brazil, Santa Catarina, is anyone from Santa Catarina here? But they still have this tradition because lots of lo um, German immigrants, they went there. So the eggs, they were not chocolate eggs. They were real eggs, boiled eggs, painted. And the kids used to exchange to each other in the Easter time. So this is the tradition. And it's beautiful. But let's bring Jesus into our kids' lives. This is important. We have so many tools nowadays. We can show cartoons. We can bring books, movies. So there are so many things we can do and really bring the Easter message, not just the chocolate, <laughs> the egg chocolate message. And these are the most important items. So we need to bring the kids to the Spirit Center. Here, we have loving teachers that are there. Every time we come here, they have kids' class, and they prepare special classes, and they teach the kids what is Jesus, what is the message, what is Easter. So bring the kids. Another important thing is the gospel at home. I know a lot of people who say, oh, since I had my kid, I stopped doing the gospel because it's too difficult to do the gospel at home with kids, forget it. No, it's not difficult. It's a little bit more complicated, but you can always change a little bit and never stop it. When my son was very young, I remember breastfeeding and doing the gospel at home. Of course, you cannot do one hour, you have to change, you have to adapt. When my son got a little bit older, I bought him a Bible because I couldn't get a spiritist book with the story of Jesus. But I got a beautiful kid's Bible with all kinds of pictures. And from one hour gospel, I was doing 10 minutes. So I started teaching him about Jesus and he was like going through the pages and of course, I did my prayers, I was with him when he got a little bit older, I taught him, and we need to start from the beginning. We have to plant the seed. If you want to put the kids to do the gospel at home with you when they are 13, forget it. You can't. It's very difficult. It will be very challenging and maybe painful. So nowadays, my son does it automatically. Ooh, it's Tuesday. Oh my God, I'm still doing homework. I have to finish quickly. And this is, is very beautiful. It's, I feel very happy about it because it's within him. I don't need to fight about it. And you know, follow the teachings of Jesus in your home. We have this tendency when we have the Spiritual Center, and then when we go home, we are kind of good actors, you know. And this is not good, guys. It's not good. You have this, this facade. And the kids, they pay attention to this. Oh, mom, you're so nice in the spirit center. When you come here, you're awful. <laughs> this is not good. We really have to do what we learn. We have to practice in everything. In everything. Even, you know, little things like, for example, your home, the phone rings. The kid goes to pick up the phone. Oh, if it's the so-and-so saying, I'm not home. What are you teaching your kid to lie? This is not good. And little things that are so important and we don't realize. We think it's normal. This is just a little thing. No. That's how corruption starts, with little things. And nowadays in Brazil, people complain so much about the politicians. And I know it's horrible. I know they have been doing really bad things. But what is the corruption within every single one of us? I know so many friends in Brazil who say, oh, that's crazy. You know, the police officer stopped me uh, because I was speeding, yes, I was speeding, but you know, not that much, just a 20 more than the maximum. So I offer him some money, you know, like, you know, how much is the ticket? 300, come on, 100 bucks. Can you believe he did not accept it? It's terrible. I'm like, wow. what? 
And that's the mentality. We, we do little corruptions that we don't realize, we think is normal. And when big people, they are exposed a lot, they do big things, we think it's horrible. So don't judge the others. Look into yourself first. When you are, when you have really done that, then you can start thinking about the others, not judging, because we are nobody to judge anyone. But we have to be something fulfilled within us to be able to be a good example to the others. So the real meaning of Easter. What's the real meaning of Easter? It's our moral transformation. And to our moral transformation happens we have to develop this respect, respecting every sense. Every sense that you can imagine. Different religions, different colors, different backgrounds. Everything you can imagine, it's important to respect the others. We respect the things that are okay to us, or people that we like. Even if people we like do a little bit thing, something wrong, we're like, oh, that's my friend. But if somebody else do it, we go crazy. Acceptance, acceptance of what is different. We tend again to accept what is normal for us. If it's a little bit different, Oh no, this forget about. No, no, this I cannot. I'm going to give you an example in my family. So my family, uh, my father's family, thank God this lecture is in English. <laughs> my father's family, they are Catholics and extremely strict. So when I told them many years ago that I was spiritist, they freaked out. I was like the evil one in the family. And they, like normal families, they all have little things. And I never mind it because they live in a tiny little city in Goiás, 10,000 people. The name of the city is Piranhas. So they live in that little tiny city in Goiás. And they, know they don't have this open mind, and it's fine. But I always say God is so good because God brings us pain or brings us things that we do not accept, and then we have to think. So I was the first one, spiritist. Then a cousin didn't declare open yet, but we already know he is gay. And the other cousin got married to a black man. So these three things for my family, they were extremely painful, but extremely necessary, and I was so happy because it happened to the people they love the most. I live far away, but the other ones, they live right there. And I know for them, this was really challenging. And because they really love, they are working within themselves to be able to respect and accept and forgive, forgive themselves for being judging so many others in the past, and now they have ones in their own family. So we need to transform all this hatred into love, selfishness, and charity. We have always to practice love and charity all the time. Only like this we really will be able to put in practice the lessons of Jesus. And this is a homework for all of you, for all of us, to auto-analyze ourselves, to acknowledge our vices, because we all have it. Sorry to tell, yes, you all have it, I all, I have it. Acknowledge, what are your vices? Think about it, because sometimes we don't acknowledge, we don't even realize we have vices, and we do have vices. So when you go home, reflect, what are my vices? What do I need to work within myself? And then after that, you will be able to start creating virtues. And this is really the message of Jesus, to have these virtues within us. And now, of course, I have to put a video so you all can reflect on it. Is it loud? Can you hear it? No. No? Let me see how to. Heavenly Father, we love you all. 